Tēnā koutou katoa. He pai, ki te kōrero, ki a koutou i tēnei rau. It's good to speak to you today. Can I start wearing a T-shirt, which a lot of young people do? Uh, some of you may know the story behind this T-shirt. This is the T-shirt. Do any of you know the time and place that the T-shirt refers to? Any ideas? We'll make this interactive. In the back, you can't escape. People standing up at the back. Who is it? When? Where? Washington, the famous march on Washington. What year? 63. A quarter of a million people marched for civil rights to Washington. Martin Luther King was the last speaker, and he had a great prepared speech on the theme of the US Bank of Justice delivering a dud check to the black people of the USA. And he was seven paragraphs into the speech talking about a promissory note, a check that had been returned marked insufficient funds. Actually, I was speaking to a group of 12 and 13 year olds a few days ago, told them this story, and I could see they just looked a bit vague when I talked about a check. I said, you know what I mean? Will you write your name and some money and sign it? And they all looked even more uncertain. I'm confident this group, as I just scanned the room briefly, will know what I'm talking about. And he stopped after seven paragraphs because he was clearly thinking he wasn't connecting with the group. And he paused. And in fact, you can hear it or read it in a great story about this speech. And one of his group of advisors in his inner group, Mahalia Jackson, a black gospel soul singer, you can hear a call out as Martin Luther King paused, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. And she was referring to a speech that he gave two months earlier in Detroit that the media covered but just got no interest. But this day, you can see him put his notes to one side and you can see him pause, and then he embarked on that famous speech about I have a dream, where black children and white children can sit down together in the sweltering heat on the plains of injustice in the Mississippi, speech that children still learn today. And one of the purposes of this story starting off is for our last session in the conference, we've got a chance ourselves to dream some dreams and think of a vision, both individually and as a group for New Zealand's children. And I hope that's what we can focus on today. And I hope it's a chance to reflect together on how sport, which we believe matters so much, can play an influence on all New Zealand's children. I should make a confession. I am a absolutely passionate and committed sports lover and one-time player. And when we're talking about adult role modelling, this father, I'm afraid, is remarkably like me, I must confess. So we'll play this video clip. Hey kids, mind if Dad has a bolt? Great. James, big gully. Dave, Arthur, garage door. Ivy, fence. Lance, long off. Gemma, back. Go back. Go back. Keep going. All the way back. All the way back. Ready, son? Get Fox Sports for the only place to see every ball of the Australian tour of South Africa live. Fox Sports, where the game never ends. Take the long walk, fella! <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know where we're heading in this talk, I want to make some introductory comments about how well are New Zealand's children really doing. And then really two challenges. One is we talk a lot about being child-centred. It's a buzzword in Wellington policy analysts' discussion. What does it mean to be child-centred? How could that relate to our sports organisations? And secondly, just to reaffirm what I think is the crucial importance of sport for young people. And given that it's New Zealand's next generation, in a sense it's a forgotten piece of the jigsaw that I don't hear talked enough about when it comes to 
the policy analyst and political talk of child well-being in New Zealand, which is all the rage, for me, a key piece of that child well-being analysis has got to be involvement and participation in sport. Continuing the sporting theme, I welcome interruptions, discussion, no contempt of court today. If you want to challenge me, I'm up for it. This little video clip makes that point nicely. Good serve. <laughs> oh, well done, madam. You've got a smile out of rapper. <laughs> I bet he's tempted to have a look. <laughs> How many, if we're talking about children and young people and using the United Nations definition under 18, how many under 18 year olds are there in New Zealand? Any suggestions, guesses, estimates? Start with the back again. A million. Do I hear more than a million? We've got a million. Is it advance on a million? Less than a million? Pardon? 400,000, 1.4 million. That's a wide range here. 400,000, 1.4 million. Any more suggestions? The answer actually is, and it's good for you to remember this just as we approach the issue, it's 1.123 million. 23% of the population. Just about one in four New Zealanders are under 18. So straight away, there's a key focus, I think, for any sporting organisation. And people often ask me, how well are New Zealand's children re really doing? I think the easiest way to sum it up, and these three percentage figures hold good just about across the whole analysis of child wellbeing, 70% do really well, some world-leadingly well. Two 16-year-olds won bronze medals at the Winter Olympics. We can hold our head high at the, at the end of good well-being. We stack up as well as, if not better, than any other Western world country. We have some terrific results, academic, sporting, culturally. There is a but. 20% really struggle with disadvantage and they're in and out of real difficulty. And 10% do as badly, if not worse. And that's a big thing to say, if not worse than any other Western world comparator. And people often challenge me on that. But if you think about it, the highest rate of youth suicide in the world reported, second highest rate of reported bullying, in schools, one of the highest rates of interpartner and family violence, one of the highest rates of abuse and neglect. I mean, they're not pretty pictures. The New Zealand of the 2018s isn't the New Zealand of the 60s and 70s when I was brought up playing cricket at Rongatai College in Wellington. Where I was proud to be a member of the first 11 and never batted one year. I was a promising leg spinner who was in the first 11 in Form 4, but dropped in Form 7 because I'd grown, lost all the flight. And the reason I didn't bat was because Bruce Edgar, Ian Smith, Clive Curry and the Cedarville brothers were in front of me. It was a great team when I look back on it. But the New Zealand of today is full of enormous disadvantage, stratification, marginalisation. It's not the country which was homogenous and essentially a huge middle class. And our office, and when I was principal youth court judge, we were drifting towards, inevitably, towards the 10% and the 20%. And a real challenge, I think, for all of us is most sporting agencies are in the 70% and are contributing terrifically towards well-being and child development. But we're not in the 20% or the 10% in particular. And just about everybody who I saw in the youth court came from that 10%. So I think a question straight away is how can we better connect with that marginalised group? And I was always a member being manager of a football team. They were 10 year olds and the coach bought the boots for one boy and picked him up every practice night and every day to get him to the practice or the game because otherwise he wouldn't be involved and his parents were never there. I thought what a great example of 
explicitly working with a boy who was clearly from a really disadvantaged and difficult family background. And in New Zealand, we leave too many of our children behind. And you could ask, are we getting it right? I don't think we are. Increasingly, we're not. And sport is becoming the preserve of the advantage, not the disadvantaged. And not only do we miss out on using the power of sport with that group, we miss out on some fantastic talent as well. I was just thinking about are we getting it right. I was in the youth court a while ago, and this boy walked in with a T-shirt, threw off his hoodie, and he clearly wanted me to see the T-shirt. And you see some provocative T-shirts in the youth court, but this was the most provocative I've seen. And he just stood there staring at me with this T-shirt, if you can all see it. And it wasn't quite what I was expecting. Can you all read it? And you can imagine what would you do in response to that sort of T-shirt? How would you engage with the young person? I somewhat lamely said, that's an interesting T-shirt. <laughs> and he said, oh, good boss. I said, well, it's a bit early to call yourself a criminal. You haven't even answered the charge yet. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. His lawyer was on his feet, waving at this stage. <laughs> but I boxed on and said, well, as a Christian myself, I can't fault your theology. But you won't know what theology means. He said, I do. It's about God stuff, isn't it? I said, yeah. I said, well, I, I believe on the other side of heaven, there'll be perfect youth justice. But I said, today, the bad news is in the Monaco Youth Court, you're stuck with me, Judge Beecroft. And he sort of laughed to himself and very respectfully but reflectively said, well, I hope you get it right. And that is a good challenge for us to be thinking about today. Are we getting it right with New Zealand children in our sport? And we could approach that from a number of angles. But he, like so many of the boys in the youth court, in fact, in the youth court, it's a small group of our toughest kids. 80%, you could say, are... Boys, male, most aren't at school. But if you look for a common denominator, apart from being male, I can scarcely think of a boy in 16 years before the youth court who was engaged in any way in sport. And that's a huge common denominator. And some of them had been really talented. I remember reading about a boy, it was in the last case I had in the youth court. I went, it could have been so many of the boys from a violent home, I mean, abused as a kid. I think he had 32 SIFS placements. Um, alcohol and cannabis was an issue at 11. But he was a real, talented rugby player. I know the bar's not so high in Auckland now, but it was said that he was... <laughs> he was said to be a blues candidate but he wasn't any longer involved. And I can just about say a common theme was there wasn't one boy involved in sport. Are we getting it right? It's the real challenge. So just some context before I get into those two specific challenges. If you're involved with young people, you need to know that the population's increasing and young people's numbers are increasing, but their percentage in the population is coming down. And this is the last statistics, but we know it's down to here now, the line graph, so it's dropping. So how can it be that the line graph is dropping, but raw numbers are increasing? What's the answer? There's one easy answer. Living longer, we've got an aging population. And anyone involved in any form of community activity, sport in particular, we need to know that the taxpayer dollar will be under increasing pull and threat from an articulate, developing, well-organised baby boomer generation, of which I am one, coming through. And that's a big challenge for the taxpayer dollar and the community dollar. And the second thing is that by 2037, the majority of under 18-year-olds won't be white. Inconceivable back in the 60s and 70s, will be brown, it is Māori, Asian, Pacifica. 
that will be the majority of our under 18. So anybody involved in all sports organisation has got to be planning about how our sports can engage, particularly with the Asian community. There's going to be, that's the, that's the group in green. It's going to be a significant percentage of under 18s within 20 years. And they're the sort of challenges that we need to be thinking about. And I can't help but start with this question, just looking at the overview of children in New Zealand before we get more particular. I mean, that's the group that disproportionately bears the burden of disadvantage in New Zealand. And this table, I think, is really interesting. This is New Zealand compared to the EU countries. The numbers are deprivation rates. High numbers is high deprivation. Low numbers, low deprivation. Overall, the first column, we don't do that badly in New Zealand. We're by no means the worst. If you look at 65 plus, we're actually near the top of the class. Which is why. Index linked universal superannuation. It's a great safety net for every older person. Under 18, we are one of the lowest, or highest, should I say, but one of the highest deprivation rates, one of the worst. You know, we dug a hole for ourselves in the late 80s, early 90s, with the global financial crisis, the mother of all budgets, and wages that grew thereafter. There was no link with benefits, and the gap is now massive. They were quite close at one stage. And we're trying madly to dig ourselves out of that hole that only happened very quickly, late 80s, early 90s. But the ratio between well-being, deprivation of under 18 and 65 plus, that ratio stands out amongst all Western countries. I didn't realise this, but we do well for our elderly, and that's great, but we do disproportionately badly with our under 18s. And a good question, just talk to your neighbour next to you. Does poverty cause adverse life outcomes? Does poverty cause non-engagement with sport? Have a brief chat, if you think it's cause or effect. All right, we could talk for a long time. Policy analysts write PhDs about it. Linda Clark said it's interwoven. I don't know whether you go so far as to say cause and effect. Minister Bennett always tells me, or ex-Minister Bennett, deeply leader of the National Party, says, well, she was poor, she got over it. So poverty is not a life script for disadvantage, but there's a high risk. I mean, the toxic stress that comes with being poor in New Zealand terms creates some real risks. And if you look at some of the graphs, this is the opposite to the school decile. So decile one's the richest and decile ten's the poorest. You can see what the social analysts call a social gradient gets worse as people gets poor. I'd love to see if there was one for sport involvement in New Zealand for this, especially for children. Organised sport. Look at that for abuse and neglect. It goes up. Infant mortality goes up. Child mental health issues. all are exacerbated by poverty. In the most recent researches, there's a genetic link, and as poverty gets harder and harder to get out of generationally, so mental health will be increasingly concentrated in the poorer areas of New Zealand, or mental health issues, which is sad and challenging and sobering. For Māori as well, they talk about a tramline gap in education. That's NCA level two achievement. It's back to the old Quintile one being the poorest and quintile five being the highest. But you see, Pākehā achievement and Māori achievement increases as the school progressively are in areas that are more advantaged. But the gap remains the same. The gap doesn't change. So that's really the context for the discussion that we're now going to have when people ask how well are New Zealand children doing. First challenge, being child-centred, involving children. I think we have done this badly in New Zealand. I'm not sure why it is. Maybe because of our colonising Victorian past, we believe children should be seen but not heard, or they're potential adults that will grow into adults, but they're not 
capable of contributing views now. And I think across the government in particular, when we designed the whole Education Act, without ever one instance of focused involvement with children, asking their views. They said some interesting things. They said, why aren't there two or three members on a school board of trustees who are young people? Why just one? It's like a token, and it's really hard if you're the one. Why do we have team teaching? It's great for the teachers, one 15-year-old said, but in a group of 90 with a specialist, we'd far rather be in smaller classrooms. And I can give you one example. I mean, I'm involved in the Wellington College Football Club, and we couldn't work out why year 11, 12, and 13 boys stopped playing football. So we got two boys on the committee and asked them, and they said, it's easy. You blokes want to do it the old-fashioned way. You have trials, you have selections, we have stratified teams. You choose the coaches, you choose the manager, and you tell us when we're going to practice. We don't want to do it anymore. I mean, we might have been good once, but we want to do it, we want to play with our mates. If you let us select our teams, and find a manager, I bet you'll find we all play. We went from four teams to 21 teams in the next year because we listened to what children, with young people, were telling us. And it was a great lesson for us. They've told us a lot about how they could be used more as coaches. They'd want to do it. They need help of refereeing. If you put, you through a, put them through a refereeing course, they would volunteer to ref. So it's transformed the way football is organised in Wellington College. It is now by a country mile the biggest participating sport in the college of 1,700 boys with 550 in the football club and 300 more playing futsal, most of whom aren't playing winter football. Another example, much more profound, Minister Tolly, when she put together the new Oranga Tamariki, got a group of care-experienced young children and said, well, they were teenagers, what are the big issues for you? And they said, when we're removed from our family, you split us up. Why don't you keep all the brothers and sisters together? And believe it or not, that wasn't a principle in the law. It is now written into the law, sibling unity is to be preserved wherever possible. It's only there because a group of young people asked for it. They said, why don't you take us to 21? All our friends go to university or training or do apprenticeships and come back for Christmas on holidays for a home. We don't have one. That's why the laws changed to 21 with an opt-in to 25. Listening to children always adds quality. I use children in this United Nations definition under 18. This little video clip, although well, Australian, is unscripted, but just makes the point nicely that children's comments add value. If I was Prime Minister, I would make it illegal. Ah ha ha. Why does he get five dollars? That's just the way it is. <laughs> Seven dollars. It should be flat out illegal, like, I'm not joking, I'm not being unreasonable. Women and men should have the same money. They should have 50-50, 60-60, if you want to do 120. It should just be how hard you work. If you do the same work, you should get paid the same money. What we're trying to tell you is that it's not fair that boys get paid more than girls. Maybe if the men noticed they were being paid more than the women, they should speak up about it. When I am older, I'm going to make a change. If I don't forget. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh, I have no words, it's so wrong. And if there are any New Zealand women or cricket players here, you would say amen to that. Children always improve our decision making. I'm not saying we listen to them and do all that they say, but we listen to them and factor it into our decision making. It is actually their right. Most people's eyes glaze over when I mention the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but we've signed up to it. Every country in the world, with the small exception of the States, has signed up to it. It's the most signed convention in the world. 
And one of the things it says is, I love these words, state parties, that's New Zealand, New Zealand organisations shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child. That must include how sports are organised. And the good news is that children want us to ask them. They want us to listen to them. I love that quote, I'm a library. In all our Saturday morning children's sport, there is a library of information there, quiet but filled with knowledge. It's dumb that I'm not asked. These are all New Zealand students. So some challenges about involving children's, getting children's voices in sport. I mean, do we seek feedback at the start and end of a season? Do we have surveys or questionnaires to all the children talking about how it's organised, what works for them, what doesn't? What was good, what was bad? What was a highlight, why? Do coaches and managers promote, I know these are jargon words, do they just allow young kids in their teams to share their views? Well, I know who the coaches, I know who the manager is, but there's a way of letting young people and children become involved. Do we reserve places for young people in management and government bodies? Does every suburban football, cricket, tennis, hockey, rugby club on the board or the committee, do they have two or three teenagers on the committee to get their views? I mean, it's worthwhile asking those questions. And on our website, we have a variety of tools that are available that you can look up about how children can be consulted of any age. I guess my point is involving children is non-negotiable. Can I give that challenge to you? Having young people in your organisation contributing is non-negotiable. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. It's a true story, actually, just reduced and just uh, released under the US Official Secrets Act an Irish lighthouse keeper. The point being, we should be non-negotiable, like a lighthouse, like a beacon. We should be demonstrating, what a great way to do it through sport, demonstrating, not only encouraging children's participation, but an outlet for children's voices and engagement. And there's a lot of ways of doing it. These are just off our website. I mean, it's not rocket science. There's a lot of ways that you could use, not only surveys, focus groups, you'd have in-depth interviews with a few at the very, Younger stage, they could take you through a Saturday team, show you what they do, get their views on it. You could get an advisory group. Although sometimes that becomes a bit tokenistic. I think, I, I think an experience has shown it's better to have them on the committee, especially if, if you can use it as a way of growing teenage involvement with the hope that they become adult committee members. Second challenge the importance of sport. They often talk about there being four domains in a young person's life, four areas that need to be functioning. They describe a young person's life like a chair. And there are four legs to a chair and they really say four legs to a young person's life. And it's not rocket science, but just guess, think, what do you think are the four areas or environment in a child's life that needs to be functioning for the life to be functioning. Family, family number one, yeah, then what? School, school. family, school, friends, someone said, friends, yeah, family, school, friends, health, but culture, wider than that, starts with C, 
community, yeah. Family, school, friends, community. Some people say integrated by a value system. Integrated by a value system, that adult should model. And good coaches do that. I mean, I speak from a Christian faith myself, others will have different value systems, but the best coaches always, I think, model a value system that young people might push against or challenge, but they want to see it modelled consistently by the coach and manager. Home, school, friends, community. And when there's real trouble at home and violence and dad might be in prison, school attendance starts to drop, associating with other friends or aren't at school with limited involvement in the community, that's the 10% we're talking about. The four legs aren't strong. And from, from my perspective, sport offers a fantastic opportunity in that fourth leg. That's why I think it's so crucial for all New Zealand children to be actively involved in sports, summer and winter. I love that sign outside of Blenheim Airport by, might be Tasman or Marlborough Sport. It was there last time I looked and had been there for about 15 years. A kid in sport stays out of court. I've used it a lot. It's just true. And why is sport so useful? Well, it models a team ethic. Exposure to good, positive role models, self-discipline. We learn to cope with adversity, with defeat. Connection with what people call pro-social friends. Learning to be part of an inclusive team culture. At Wellington College, we say enjoyment and excellence in football as a means for developing character and turning, turning boys into young men. That's our motto for football, as a means of turning boys into young men, in the round, with everything that football offers. And we say to a lot of kids, you might not be an all-white, but you might be an all-white's manager, you might be an all-white's coach, you might be an all-white's referee. We try really hard to develop an inclusive perspective. And it means using sport to be intentional as a means of a greater end than just building sporting competence and success. And I think those three myths that Sport New Zealand have promoted, what are they, those three myths? Early talent identification seldom works. There's only actually one tennis player in Europe who was an under-12 champion who went on to become anything. Admittedly, it was Roger. But no one else who was an under-12 champion in any European country has gone on to be anything in tennis. What are the other two myths? Focus on winning. Focus on winning. Third one? Sport New Zealand to hell. I might have to pick on some Sport New Zealand people. <laughs> I heard Alex. Is, at, is Alex here? I heard him on Radio New Zealand. There are three myths anyway. That's right, concentrating on one sport only early. Kuma Sangakara was a tennis champion before he was a cricket champion. A.B. de Villiers won South Africans swimming and tennis champs as a 15-year-old before he was even in cricket. And yet we tell our boys at Wellington College, unless you abandon everything for cricket at age 14 or 15, you're never going to get there. Then different boys grow and get bigger and develop psychologically quite differently. And I think there are those sorts of challenges and no lesser organisation than Sport New Zealand, you probably know all this, but I'm putting it up, have identified five great values in sporting involvement. I mean, that in itself justifies it. Essential life skills. Brain development. I mean, you'd think the government would be just promoting almost compulsory involvement in some sort of sport for every under 11-year-old. And that's true. I've seen so many boys who were struggling academically have got into the rigour of sport and transferred the lessons over about planning organisation. It's been really interesting how it's worked. So 
I mean, I guess I'm preaching to the converted, but it's quite good just to look at Sport New Zealand's five-point report that tells you why involvement in sport, especially for children, is good. I mean, of course there are some risks which we need to be aware of. I mean, that toxic culture can produce bad sportsmanship. Actually, I was in Australia, I like this, speaking to the Children's Commissioner's conference there, and there was a day for community involvement about this big, and I pulled out my handkerchief and dropped a ticket. I said, oh, if I was Australian, it would have been a square of yellow sandpaper, <laughs> which they quite enjoyed. I mean, the winning at all costs breeds the bad sportsmanship. When I was manager of the third 11 at Wellington College, playing the fourth 11, I was walking around the sideline, my son was in the third 11, cricket. I was just listening to the sledging that was going on while the bowler was bowling from the inner circle of fielders. You blank, you effing this, you're never going to succeed. So I heard it, it was just constant. So I went around to the two managers of the two teams, third and fourth level, I wasn't a manager then, and said, you probably don't know what's going on. They said, oh yeah, we do, we can hear it. That's what boys do now, they said. That's what boys do now. I'd just come to the school, if I'd been more confident, I would have said, well, that's not what adults do. Adults would go out and stop the game and talk to the boys about sportsmanship, and there'd be consequences if that continued. But that's surrendering to teenagers, and when I often see coaches now and I think they forget who's the adult with the frontal lobe that's developed, and who's the teenager. I think we've got to be a lot more confident about saying these are the standards and this is what we expect, and sport's a great way of teaching that. Success over participation can destroy self-esteem. Anger and violence develop if defeat handled badly rather than losing as an opportunity to learn. We had a team, went to college football again, I just use that, but when they lost, they spat on their hands before they shook the other time. We had to take them out to the other school and apologise during the week to teach a lesson. I mean, again, we as adults can use sport as a learning opportunity. Drug use encouraged. At an ever lower age, young children are being taken, advised in year nine with diet supplements and powder unsafe diets. In summary, why do we emphasise winning over effort? Surely effort should be what we want to see. I mean, I, I'm, one of the, well, I'm not one of the worst losers. I hate losing as much as anyone. But we've got to show character in how we lose. Why do we, why do we focus on sporting ability over character? Why don't we penalise boys who get drunk on the bus to a school game by not playing? Because character should be more important, even if they are the best person on the team. Winning, effort should be over winning, character over ability. I conclude with a T-shirt. <laughs> it's a great story, really, of character. Some of you may know the story. It was little known until recently. This is the T-shirt. Do you know the story? What is it that's going on? What sporting event? Olympics. What year? 68. The event? 200 metres. The US were confident that they would win every track event and they decided actually not to go to Mexico as a protest because of the civil rights unrest and issues in the US. But they were persuaded to go and they were going to protest at every race they won, but they all wimped out until the 200 metres, which is the last individual race usually before the relays in the Olympic athletic calendar. Confident to be first, second, third, and Tommy Smith was first, John Carlos was third, but an Australian, Peter Norman, came second. So they went to him straight away and said, Peter, we want to do the Black Power Salute, but it's your ceremony too. How do you feel about it? And he said, I'm a Salvation Army boy from Melbourne, Australia. I support you. I'll wear a Athletes Against Racism badge. 
And then Thomas Smith said, we've got a problem. John Carlos forgot his gloves. So it was Peter Norman who said, well, Tommy, you'll have to wear the glove on your right hand. And Tommy Smith, I mean, John Carlos, third, you'll have to wear it on your left, which accounts for the first place getter having the glove on the right and the third place getter having it on the left, which was somewhat of a breach of protocol, but that's what they had to do. And you'll know that a huge commotion followed. And in the end, the US team buckled under pressure and they excluded and ejected Smith and Carlos from the games and they never ran for the States again. Peter Norman ran the fourth fastest time in the world in 72 to qualify for Munich. But because he'd worn that little tin badge, they didn't want to select him. And they did it by not selecting any sprinters that year to go for Australia to Munich because they said no one was good enough. And Peter Norman never ran for Australia again. And it's all told in a great DVD called Salute, the story of the 200 metres medal ceremony. And in it, you see Peter Norman's funeral and his coffins being carried out of a packed Salvation Army citadel. And the pallbearers, front left and front right, are Tommy Smith and John Carlos. They'd flown all the way over from the States because they said this man, under pressure, showed character. He stood up for his values and he modelled them. And what a great reminder of the power of sport as a vehicle for developing and displaying character. And what a great vehicle it is for our most disadvantaged 10 and 20% to develop their own character. They probably won't get any other opportunity, just about any other area of their life, because they're not much at school, but sport could do it. That's my challenge, and I hope we can leave today with a renewed vision. In the words of that wee boy, I hope you don't forget. When you go back to the management and organisation of sport that involves so much that you don't forget about prioritising participation, involvement and the voices of children and young people in what we do. Thank you very much. Uh, just stay with us. Um, I want to, uh, I've got to, we're going to go a little tiny smidgy over time because I want to ask a couple of the questions that you have put forward while Judge Beecroft has been speaking. The other thing I wanted to do is just endorse what he, I mean, this guy is amazing, right? So he tells you to listen to young people and I know that you're nodding and thinking yes, but at the same time, because we're all crusty old adults, you can kind of put the roadblocks in your head about how it's harder in real life and in your situation it wouldn't be possible. Um, Judge Beecroft challenged us at Wellington College, I'm on the board, um, to you to listen to the students when we appointed a new principal yeah, at the end example. of last year. Yeah, it is. He cornered me in a supermarket actually and said, um, what are you doing to incorporate um, young people in the process? Now, to be absolutely fair, at the time I said to him, yeah, no, that's absolutely, <laughs> and got in the car and thought, shit, we're not doing anything. So um, it was a challenge and I thought, no, you know, initially I could think of all the reasons why we wouldn't be able to do it. It had never been done before. We're hiring someone for an extremely important role. We've got a whole lot of response. This is a, this is a grown up job to hire a principal. Um, but then we thought about it a little bit more and we decided we would actually incorporate uh, young people in the process. So what we did is we got down to the final candidates, and um, which was a laborious process in itself, and when we got down to the last uh, couple of candidates, they came to Welling flew into Wellington for um, a day of, of final round of interviews. They'd been interviewed previously um, by board members, but at the final round of interviews, we asked them to be interviewed by a panel of three senior students. So we had chosen three students. We didn't want them all to be the same. So we wanted one who was really a leader in sport at the school, one who was an academic leader at the school, and one who'd had some troubles at the school, who had been a kid that had had to actually, a sort of um, kind of mid-batsman, if you want to say, kind of middle of the field, but had had a couple of run-ins, so wasn't your perfect pupil. Uh, and we asked the three of them to turn up. We didn't give them a script. We said they could ask any questions they liked and we asked them then to present their findings to the panel. And it was a bit of a risk, but it was so, it was the best thing that I've ever done, actually. Um, 
the the people who the candidates all said how impressed they were, but also how tested they were. Um, the boys asked completely different questions than we did, questions we would never, ever have thought about. Uh, when they came back and presented to the board about their findings, um, they had a completely open and really a grown-up discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of each candidate. And actually, they chose the same person that we had, but for slightly different reasons. But it w gave us so much confidence that when we were appointing somebody in that position, we were doing exactly the right thing. And that new candidate, Gregor Fountain, has been in the job a month and has had a seamless transition. And one of the reasons I think his transition's been so seamless is that all of the boys knew that they actually were part of the process. So thank you, Andrew. But it is quite challenging but it does actually work. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you some two quick questions. So one of the questions, and it's been asked by a number of um, delegates through our app while you were talking, is how do you reach the 10%? Because engaging with that 10%, everyone finds it difficult, right? Mm. So do you have to go through uh, and work with relevant government agencies, or are there other ways? Have you got any practical suggestions? Well, there'd be three ways. One would be... Orang and Kamariki and the local, they've got offices all around New Zealand. One would be Police Youth Aid, who are really good and they, they work with a lot of families that are at risk but not actually in trouble. And schools would be one, primary schools. Going to the primary schools and saying, who are your boys and girls who are least involved? I can remember the football club where we were in, in the Onslow Football Club could have gone to all the primary schools, they might for all I know, and said, well, who are the boys who aren't involved? Who are the girls who are not involved? And we'd be really happy to arrange ways where they could be picked up and help with uniforms and be involved. So there are three things I think that could be done. Yesterday we heard from the leader of the Australian Sports Commission and one of the things that she raised, um, just as an idea essentially, was a voucher system or a sort of subsidised uh, approval or approach to the less well-off. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, all the talk we've had about social investment, that's one arm of social investment, providing targeted assistance for the most disadvantaged. I mean, the other part is turning the tap off so they don't come through, but I, I quite like the idea of, in a way that's not stigmatising or judgmental, but just quietly saying we can provide help and assistance if you want your boy or girl to be involved in the team, it's going to be no problem. We can arrange for registration and uniform. I like the idea, yeah. And lastly, just a little a bit of anxiety, I think, from some delegates is that if you, I mean, some of these guys are working, and you will know because you've been a volunteer yourself, but uh, it's hard enough to keep the wheels on the bus sometimes. If some of these organisations shift their focus to the 10 and 20%, will not the 70% be disadvantaged in yeah, some way? I'm not suggesting avoid the 70%, keep going. I'm not even saying grab everybody in the 10% because that's going to have some problems. I think better to pepper pot one or two, preferably one in every team, so that the, the team ethic takes over. It actually only needs two in a team who are together and know each other, who are disruptive and not used to the approach for it to be very difficult for a coach. So I think one pepper potted around a whole lot of the teams, and most of the clubs now have got 20 or 30 teams. But it only need, all, each club only needs to be changing, choosing one, two or three and putting them in different teams just quietly and seamlessly. I'm not asking for the revolution, but just a more targeted way. If you had five of those boys and girls involved, one in each team, well, the coach that you thought would be able to cope, a small start, but if everybody did that, it would be some significant change. There's a challenge for you. Moana Lee, I'd ask you to come to the stage and give the official thanks. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, in my uh, previous way life, I used to work for the courts department. And so I heard a lot of lawyers and judges, uh, sum ups, and now I find myself in a position of summing up a judge. <laughs> so I go to my safe place of te ao Māori, and there are, we have beautiful whakatauki in our in our culture, which is not just for Māori, but for everyone, and, and statements that were passed on to us or passed down to us from our ancestors. 
and I think these really these statements really resonate when I hear you and when I see you. Um, and the first one is kia pono ki te kaupapa, being authentic to your truth. Ko koe tēnā, that is you. Kia tika te mahi, doing the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Ko koe tēnā, that is you. Me aroha ki te tangata, loving and respecting others. Ko koe tēnā, that is you. Tēnā koe, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.